If you've been around Westside for the last three years, you know that we do this thing called What If the Church? It began in May of 2008 when three pastors from the area got together and started asking the question, what would happen if we cooperated together between churches? What would happen if we viewed other churches as our teammates rather than our competition? Those three guys were Pastor Dan Diebel over at Heartland Community Church, Pastor Brian Wright over at Cedar Ridge Community Church, and this crazy South African named Pastor Sean Collin from Westside. And that first year, those three churches swapped pulpits, prayed together, served together, worshiped together, and had a great experience. The next year, it was 13 churches around Kansas City. Last year, 23 churches in the KC metro area. And check this out. Because we're combining it this year with another event called Global Day of Prayer, there will be more than 50 Kansas City churches participating in the effort that we begin today. In fact, yeah, I agree. Go God. That's kind of cool. In fact, one of our own pastors, Matt Adams, is now the coordinator for What If the Church across the city. So we begin a series today with 50 other churches. Can you imagine all moving this direction in the next three weeks? It's the What If the Church series, but notice what it's called. Find your notes. It's called Called. That's what we're talking about this year, that God has called the church together to do three things. Now, a couple of months ago, we did a series called Sent, where we discovered that if you're a Christ follower, God wants you to be a priest, a pastor, a minister, a missionary to be sent. That was sort of the individual idea. What we're going to look at the next three weeks is God has called all of his followers in all of his churches to do three things together that will make a difference in this world. So write this in. Here's the background for this series. The New Testament word for church is ekklesia. Some of you have been wanting to know a little Greek. Now, you already know a little Greek. He runs a deli down the street from your house. I got it. But here's a little more Greek. It's ekklesia. It literally means the called ones, or in, more specifically, even the called out ones. God sees us, his church, as sharing a calling, a calling he has given us. Therefore, next idea, if you're a Christ follower, there's a calling in your life, a calling in your life. He's calling all Christ followers to three specific things. So here's the big idea for this three-week series. We are the church, and therefore, we're called by God to do three things with all the other Christ followers in all the other churches. We're called to look up. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's prayer. Most of our prayer, get this, is focused on us. Most of our prayer is not looking up. It's, God, we want you to look down here. We want you to fix this mess that we've created. And that's okay, but prayer is a lot more than that. Next week, we're going to look at the idea that we're called to stand out, which is the idea of holiness. Here's the premise for next week. You can't make a difference in the world if you're not different from the world. God calls us to be different, to stand out. And then the last week, we're going to talk about God calls us to go back in. He calls us to action. Love is not something you feel. It is something you do. And he wants to partner with us in reaching our neighborhood, our city, our entire community, our world for Jesus Christ. The main verse for this series is the Great Commission. Notice what Jesus says. I'm reading from the New Century Version. Go and make followers of all people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything. Would you circle everything? Teaching folks to obey part of what Jesus taught is not an option. Teaching them to obey the things we like, that's not an option. Teach them to obey everything that I have taught you, and I will be with you always, even unto the end of this age. That's the introduction to the next three weeks. Here's the big idea for today's teaching. God invites us to see what he is doing in the world and join him in it. We do that through prayer. This is a blow my mind truth. 
The God of this universe says, partner with me. Now, he's always the senior partner. Don't get any co-partner idea going. He's in charge. But he says, I'm looking for a people I can work through. I'm looking for a people where I can display my love and grace, as we talked about in the last series about home, and pour out my love and grace. I'm looking for a Christ followers, for churches who will partner with me in what I'm doing in the world. And what he wants to say to us today is, I want you to see what I'm doing and join me in it. And we do that through prayer. Here's our verse for today's teaching. It's out of the book of Isaiah. See, I am doing a new thing, God says. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. How do we move past prayer that's centered on us? How do we move past the superficial thing? How do we embrace a calling to prayer? What would happen if all God's people and all God's churches prayed and joined him? It's an amazing thought. Here's three ways to move into our calling to prayer. Number one, we need to ask God to let us see what he's doing in the world around us and start praying for it. Ask God to let you see what he's doing in the world around you and start praying for it. Here's how most of us pray. Y'all look this way. We pray 9 prayers. God, I'm in trouble. I need help fast. Please show up. Let's be honest. How many of you pray more when you're in trouble than when you're not in trouble? Rest of you are lying. <laughs> we all do. I mean, isn't it amazing how holy we get when we're in trouble? You know, and the outrageous promises we make. Hey, God, you rescue me here. I'll tithe the rest of my life. You know, I'll even be a missionary somewhere, God, whatever it is. I mean, we pray these 911, I'm in trouble prayers. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Jesus invites us to that. But prayer is so much more than 911. It's the way that we say, God, if you'll let me see what you're doing in my world around me, I will join you in it. Boy, I got my eyes opened up to this just several years ago. I was in Bogota, Colombia, and I got to attend the second largest church in the history of Christianity. They have 300,000 people a weekend in attendance. They meet in a dozen soccer stadiums across the city of Bogota. It is an amazing, amazing church. And we went to a Sunday night service in a soccer stadium, 25,000 people in attendance in that one service that night. I thought it was a worship service. My interpreter explained to me as the service went, it was a small group leader training. <laughs> Did you catch that? This church has 25,000 small group leaders. It's, I, my mind's just being blown, just bigger and bigger. And I watched them do an unusual thing. They had a set of flags across the back of their platform, and they marched the flag of the United States of America down the middle of this soccer stadium and up onto the platform and put it in place right next to the podium where the pastor was speaking. And my interpreter explained to me, as 25,000 people got on their knees, that they prayed for a nation of the world each month, and that particular month it was the United States, and their prayer was this, God, do whatever it takes to bring America back to you. In my fire group settings now. I'm in one on Sunday night and Monday night and Wednesday night. We always start with 15 or 20 minutes of just shooting the breeze, talking about football or basketball or, or you know, baseball or whatever. Somebody always brings up the economy. Would you guys agree the economy is just pretty much in the toilet right now? Is there anybody thinking this economy is great? I mean, it's been tough. And you know what? It's real easy to blame Washington. It's real easy to say those bozos don't have a clue. But what if, what if 
God is allowing what's happening in our country to bring us to our knees so we will return to him. Oh, we've been chasing a consumer mentality for years. Don't get that wrong. We've barred our way into debt, both as a nation and as individuals. We all have a piece of the pie here in the blame game. But what if the bigger picture is not, hey, God, rescue the economy, which is a 911 prayer. What if the bigger picture is, God, do whatever it takes to bring our country back to you? What if God's actually at work in this and we just have to see it and join him in it? The problem with 911 prayers, if it's the only kind you pray, listen, church, is they're all centered right here. God help me, 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 my, 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 God. And that's okay. But there's a bigger prayer out there, and that's God, what are you doing in this world and how do I join you? We want to move up. We were called to prayer. The second way we move into that calling is we ask God to help us choose purpose over preference in all things. Choose purpose over preference in all things. Now, let me unpack this for a minute and try to explain it. I think the number one prayer that we as Christ followers pray probably is 911 prayers, and that's okay. There's just more. But I think the second maybe most popular category of prayers we pray, I would call preference prayers. We pray things like this. Lord, this house is okay, but I'd really like a bigger, better one. God, this car is all right, but I'm kind of thinking there's another one out there for me. God, this job's okay, but I'd really prefer a better one. God, this husband's all right. Can you change him, please? God, these kids are okay, but they're not what I signed up for. And if you don't know your kids are praying for new parents, they are. (laughs) We pray these preference prayers. Haven't we done that? I mean, God, I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to do that. It's like we're sitting in in a restaurant that serves answered prayer, and we're going, I'll take new house, new car, new husband, new kids, new teeth, new health, New da 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 God, here's my preferences. I'm going to turn in my order. Do we really think God is some cosmic vending machine in the sky that if you just put in the quarter of prayer and make your choice, that he sends it out? I think he calls us to a higher thing. Now, is it okay to voice preferences to God? Yes, but again, it's self-centered. It's the step up from 911. God, here's the mess I've created. Please save me. God, here's what I want. Please give me. Give me, give me, give me. Bless me, bless me, bless me. Give me, bless me, give me, give me, bless me, bless me. We even did this whole thing years ago around a book somebody wrote about pray, pray, bless, bless, give, give me, me. Wow, really? That's where we want to go? That's not the idea. The idea that's deeper than that is let me choose purpose over preference. Let me see if I can demonstrate it. How many of you read Rick Warren's book several years ago, The Purpose Driven Life? Did you read it? Next to the Bible, the best-selling book in American history. 26 million copies. Nothing else comes close. I think the first four words of the introduction were the best part of the book. Anybody remember? It's not about me. It's not about me. He goes on to say life is not about me. Marriage is not about me. Parenting is not about me. Church is not about me. The kingdom of God is not about me. It's not about me. We've bought into this self-centered Christianity that says, here's my 911s, God, and here's my preferences, God, and it's all about me. Prayer is not, hey, God, look down here at me. Prayer is, hey, God, help me see what you're doing and join you in it. And we got to choose purpose over preference. If we're not careful, guys, check this out. It even affects our choice of churches. Can I give you an example? Write it in. Consumer mentality says, I want to be part of a church. Now, I could have said job, marriage, career, ball team. I could have said a lot of things, but I put church here. I want to be part of a church that fits me and meets my needs. Do you hear it again? 
It's all about me. It's all about me. I mean, we even do that with church. Even with church. It's a consumer mentality. How about a contributor mentality that says instead, I want to be part of a church that's making a difference in the world. Because it's not about me. It's about purpose. My parents are 77 and 78 years old now. And uh, they've been part of a church in Dallas that's been in decline for 10 years. Probably for longer than that. But they've been running about 80 to 90 uh, people in church for the last 10 years. And the 80 to 90 people are all 80 to 90. (laughs) Are, Are you with me? I mean, my folks are 77 and 78, and they're called some of the youngsters in the church. And it's, it's been a heartbreak to both of my parents, but particularly to my mom, because she remembers back when we were in high school and part of that church, you know, 35, 40 years ago, that, that it was a church of 13, 1400 and had families, and it's got a great facility and reached a lot of kids and stuff. But it, the church has just been through tough times. Check this out. In the last several years, they had not even had to open their nursery or their children's area on Sunday morning because there was never a baby or a child or a young adult family that even visited the church. 80 or 90 people in their 80s and 90s holding on, but praying God do something new in our church. Two years ago, another church in town contacted them and said, We are on two sites already. We're doing five services on each of those sites. We're growing and reaching young and middle-aged adults, and we need another facility. Would you pray about giving us your church building? And 80 to 90, 80 and 90-year-olds prayed about it for three months and chose purpose over preference. They signed it over. To so the church. Today, there are four services and 2,500 people attending the Northway campus of the Village Church in Dallas. The nursery's full. My mom calls every Sunday afternoon in tears. Dan, I can't believe what's happening at our church. There's babies at our church, Dan. There's children in our church. She doesn't say Dan. She says Danny, but you can't do that. <laughs> Danny, you just won't believe it. It's, it's so We have to come 30 minutes early to get a seat. We're filling up four services a weekend, Danny. It's God. And then she adds, but I don't like the music. <laughs> I have to wear my earplugs every week. And I sit down front, but it's okay because there's babies. That's maturity. That's a 77-year-old woman choosing God's purpose over her preference. Her preference would have been to just hang on with the 80 to 90, 80 to 90-year-olds. My mom and dad are part of the Sunday school class they call the next to the graveyard class. I asked her why they called it that, and she said, there's no class above us. She said, you leave our class, you've died. You're in heaven. That's the only graduation we have. And this group of 80 and 90-year-olds have chosen to join God in what he's doing in the city, even though it doesn't fit their preference. Do we hear that, church? God's looking for a people who are not content to just pray 911 prayers. He's looking for a people that are not content just to pray, God, give me my preference prayers. He's looking for a people who say, God, what are you doing around me and how do I join you? Third idea, we need to ask God to help us find and be part of a spiritual movement in this world. Help us find and be part of his spiritual movement in this world. There's a little bit of despair happening among the American church right now, and I hear it voiced like this. America is becoming less and less Christian. We're in trouble. You know what my response to that is? The darker the night, the brighter the fire. 
The more darkness around us, the more light stands out and people are drawn to it. And you and I have got a choice. We can be part of the problem or we can be part of the solution. We can keep a consumer mentality or we can take a contributor mentality. We can be part of the spiritual desert that is America right now or we can be part of the spiritual oasis that is Jesus. Notice what he said in this verse. I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way. God says it gets dark. You find yourself in the desert. I'll make a way. And I'm creating streams in the middle of the desert. Would you write this in your notes? I think our prayer needs to become, God, help me be a way in the wilderness. Help me be a stream in the wasteland. God, do something so new in me and fill me so much with Jesus that others can find that oasis. Because the drier the desert, the more important the oasis is. I want you to write this in your notes. It's our last thought, but we're not going to finish with this. We've got a couple of things planned. We've deliberately taught early in the worship today so that we can spend some time in corporate prayer. We're going we're gonna to together pray as a people of God and orchestrated worship and prayer time. But here's the thought that I want to start into that with. One of the major things God is doing in the world today is a prayer movement. It's an unbelievable prayer movement. And we'll tell you about it in just a minute. Will we be part of it? Keep your notes out and we'll give you one more thing to write down in just a second. A few years ago, a group of people in Africa started this thing called a Global Day of Prayer. They decided one day a year they'd pray for what God was doing around the globe. Ten years later, last year, 500 million, do not miss the number, 500 million Christ followers from every country in the world prayed for God to work in our world on one day, in one 24-hour period. That's a movement. We've decided at Westside this year to marry What If the Church with this movement called the Global Day of Prayer. And I want to give you three ways you can be part, and then we're going to have a time of worship and prayer today. One way, when you go out to the information table afterwards, there's a brochure that says Global Day of Prayer. You know what it actually is? It's 10 days of prayer. And there's a different theme for each of the 10 days. It starts June 2nd. It culminates June 12th, which is our big day of worship together with those 50 other churches, which will be awesome on Sunday afternoon. You can pick the prayer guide up out there. If you don't grab the guide, or even if you do, here's another way to get information. Here's why your notes are out. If you text the word prayer to this number, we'll send you a daily reminder for those 10 days of what we're praying for. It'll be a text message. So if you'll text the word prayer to this number, it should be on the screen, 74574. Then for those 10 days, you'll get something that says, hey, it's day one, we're praying for this. Remember to pray today. It's day two, we're praying for that. But thirdly, and I love this, Westside has never done anything this big. A year ago, we did a 24-hour period of prayer where we asked people to sign up and pray straight for 24 hours. You know, people took five in the afternoon and two in the morning and different hours. We're doing that for 10 days this year. We're asking God to let us see what he's doing in the world and join him in it. So if you're willing to sign up for one hour during those 10 days, you can go to our website, click on My Impact, and it'll give you the times. You can come here to the church to pray during the hours from 7 in the morning to 9 at night. We ask you to pray at home through the middle of the night. I hope you'll sign up. Here's something cool. You ready for this? Our orphan kids in South Africa, in India, and in Thailand are signing up for times of prayer through the 10 days for the Global Day of Prayer. They're praying for you. I don't know what that does to you, but the thought that a 10-year-old orphan in India is given an hour to pray for me and for Westside and for what's happening, I... I can't wait to see what happens. Last time I checked, God pays attention when kids pray. So let's pray. 
it's going to be an awesome time. Here's what I want us to do with our time of prayer today. I'm going to ask you to stay right where you are and just focus on Jesus. I'm going to pray a brief prayer now. The band is going to come and lead us in a song of worship to prepare us even more for prayer. And then I'm going to come out and lead us in a corporate time of thankfulness and a corporate time of saying, God, help us see what you're doing. And a corporate time of saying, God, we want to partner with you and commit to you and join you. Here's my challenge to you. Go at this time of prayer. God wants to speak to us today. He wants to speak to you today. Let's pray together as we begin this time of prayer and worship. Jesus, the thought that you want to partner with me to do anything is amazing. And God, I see so clearly in your book you call me to pray. Not just the 911 stuff when I'm in trouble, the preference stuff, Lord, when my wants exceed my needs. But Lord, the kind of prayer that says, I want to see what you're doing and be part of it. As we worship now, as we pray through these next moments, please speak to us. We're listening. We're yours.